Okay, I think we can start. We are now live. Uh, welcome to this webinar. This is the eight uh, episodes of the Area MSME Talks. Uh, I'm Giulia Emone Marsan, Area Director for Strategy and Partnership. This is the second episode of the series dedicated to women, women economic empowerment issues. The first one we had was a few weeks ago, and it was dedicated to the topic of women entrepreneurship. And we will actually share some information about this webinar throughout the chat box. Uh, we will send some links, so keep an eye also on that. Um, let me start by thanking all speakers for being with us uh, today. It's really a great pleasure to start the conversation with them. And also to all of you, to all participants for joining this discussion. We discuss today uh, women in STEM and the digital economy. STEM meaning science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It is a very important topic for everybody around the world and also for the ASEAN region. Evidence shows that women tend to be less represented in STEM education and jobs, including across ASEAN. This is especially important for the ASEAN region as the digital economy is growing very quickly at a very fast pace. And many of the new jobs of the post-pandemic economy are very likely to be digital enabled or digital related. And this is why uh, women and girls uh, need to get access to uh, the education, uh, the skills, uh, enabling them to have access to these jobs. It's the topics we uh, are working on at the area, uh, the topic of ASEAN women and the digital economy, and we will be able to soon share a paper on the topic. So please uh, stay connected with us and keep an eye at our website if you're interested to learn more. Uh, let me just give a couple of data before starting introducing uh, uh, speakers. If we look at the 2020 Global Gender Gap Report, uh, if we look at uh, LinkedIn users globally, uh, women make up a uh, low proportion of technical careers uh, in frontier technologies. Only 26% of data and artificial intelligence roles, only 15% of engineering roles, and only 10% of cloud computing roles, just to mention a few. And this comes from uh, the World Economic Forum 2020. Uh, in ASEAN, when we look at data also in the region, uh, women in science are specializing more in the health science and much less in technology and math-oriented programs. So this is uh, an issue and we will discuss about all that uh, with our uh, great speakers for today. Uh, but before introducing them, let me just remind you to please uh, keep your microphone muted throughout the entire duration of the webinar, but feel free to interact with us uh, uh, by using the chat box. Uh, we hope to get uh, comments, ideas, and also questions from all of you or you, know, uh, you that we will use uh, later during the Q&A in the final part uh, of this webinar. Now, uh, I'm very glad uh, to have with us today uh, Chan In In. She's the CEO and co-founder of, of Bot District uh, from Singapore. It's a no-code UX-driven chatbox building platform, and we will hear about that uh, very soon. She started her career, career in a rocket intern startup tending to real conversation with consumers about their daily needs, while at the same time studying and earning her bachelor's degree. She co-founded Bot District and now is managing several customers and hundreds of thousands of users. Welcome and thank you, Inin. Uh, we have uh, today uh, with us also Mazlita Maz Hassan, Maz, who's the co-founder of Reka. Um, She's also the co-founder of Unoya, an edutech startup, where they built this platform called the RECA, uh, which stands for Recorded Question and Answer. And we will hear more about RECA very soon. She has a bachelor and master degree in computer science from the University College London and the Birbeck College of the University of London in web data mining. She has written several research papers, uh, appeared in international journals, and participated in international conferences. Uh, she spent 11 years in London studying and working in various companies, providing consultancy work in IT and web data mining. And she's also an advocate uh, to get more young women into STEM, into the digital economy, and into innovation. 
thank you, Mas, uh, for being with us. It's also a great pleasure uh, to have with us uh, on the panel uh, Ms. Kinkeo Duang Saban. She's the CEO of Datacom, uh, an ICT company based in Laos. She studied computer science and informatics in Germany, where she received a master's degree from the Technical University of Ilmenau. She also received additional training in cloud computing uh, technology in the Silicon Valley in the US and held several positions at Datacom before becoming CEO in 2018, including being the pro a programmer and sales director. She has worked uh, on a broad range of projects uh, with both Lao and international partners, including with the banking industry and the Lao Ministry of Finance. And she's one of the new vice presidents of the Lao ICT Association. Thank you and welcome, Kim Keo. And we have with us, uh, this is a great pleasure, uh, Liza Noonan, who is the ASEAN Director for CSIRO, uh, the Australian National Science Agency. Liza is responsible for supporting a broad portfolio of science and innovation activities, uh, spanning uh, from data science, advanced manufacturing, agriculture and food, health, uh, low emission technology, and environmental sustainability. And previously, she was the executive manager of innovation at CSIRO and the founder of the ON Accelerator, Australia's first national science and technology accelerator supporting public funded research. She has an extensive experience in innovation and technology as CEO of Springboard Enterprises Australia, a venture backer of female founded businesses. And now she's also a non-executive director and joint vice president of the Australian Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. And previously she sat on the executive council of the IoT Alliance Australia and served as a non-executive director for the Canberra Innovation Network. Welcome and thank you very much uh, also to you, Liza. So we can now start uh, immediately and because we have so much to, to discuss, our first round of questions. And uh, I will continue our tradition to start with our entrepreneurs. So in particular, let's start with Maz and In In. Uh, I would ask you to share with us what made you interested in technology and how uh, was your experience to start your own business? And also as a woman entrepreneur in STEM, whether you had any specific challenge uh, you had to face. And let's start this round with uh, uh, Maz. Maz, the floor is yours. Hello everyone. Um, welcome to the seminar, oh, sorry, webinar. Uh, my name is Maz. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Reka. Uh, Reka is a platform that preserves collective knowledge for communities and organizations where learning is crowdsourced within the community itself. Uh, the question before was, uh, how do I get interested in technology? Actually, it's not my choice. I was given a scholarship to pursue computer science um, in the UK. So um, yeah, that, that's where the journey began. Um, and then, uh, how do you say, uh, along the way, I kind of like find myself to be super attracted to the field itself because I know I'm very analytical and this is where I am today. So uh, back into Reka, Reka is actually my second startup. I have uh, another startup a couple of years ago and uh, called Resight still starts with R and I exited about two years ago. So for um, Reka, I think about think of us as um, a more structured private Facebook group with predefined categories and subcategories, uh, which is highly customizable, which admin can uh, administer from the background. And we are also uh, a combination of what I said just now, a Facebook group and also LinkedIn, where members can have their profiles. They can also connect with experts. So we're also like Quora, where members can ask questions for advice. So uh, the reason why we started Reka in the first place is because there's so many contents being shared on the on, on social media, on our Facebook groups, on WhatsApp groups. I mean, if I like me myself, I have um, at least 10 groups, you know, WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups, discussing about technology, discussing about business models, women in tech, and there's so many learnings. People are sharing links, people are sharing ideas, and I'm one of those who actively star or save, and um, sometimes like, you know, copy and paste, put it in another, let's say, Google Keep for me to refer later. And that's where the idea came, um, Africa came about. It's like, 
can't I have a centralized platform that I can put all my learnings, everything that the community has already uh, put out there, I want it to be centralized so that it's easier for me to go and search for it later. So um, we begin, um, Reka begins um, its proof of concept earlier this year when we had an opportunity to work with the Malaysian uh, Ministry of Education, where we also help them to build their digital learning platform called Delima. So we work with Google Edu, my co-founder is also a Google Premier Partner in Malaysia. So we deployed about 5.5 million Google um, G Suite account for the students and teachers of Malaysia. So at that point, um, the ministry has a requirement to have a platform, a centralized platform for teachers to share teaching resources with other teachers. So imagine if you are a teacher from a training college and you want to start teaching probably a subject at math next year. So where do you go uh, to find all the resources? You can go on Google and start filtering one by one, or you can come to a centralized platform where the ministry has all the, how to say the, uh, here in Malaysia, they call it like Idiwira or like the super, super teachers that has all the all this material that are ready for you to use and for you to refer. And you can also connect with all these teachers to ask for some advice and mentoring. So that's how um, Reka came into the picture. And from there, we started to grow. And now we are in various verticals like um, NGOs. We are now working with UNICEF Malaysia to provide Reka for the teachers and students of marginalized communities such as the undocumented children and also stateless children and teachers. So um, the other question that um, Julia asked, do I face any hurdles when starting the business? I mean, as a woman, um, in terms of gender hurdles, not really. I find that my male counterparts are, oh, are very, um, how do you say, very supportive and I myself are actively involved with a lot of um, startup events, startup groups to just, how to say, um, upskill myself and to learn more. So um, for the most part, I feel that my journey has been really inspiring and I really, how to say, excited to be here. So that's all for me for now. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting story and perspective, Mas. Now let's move on with the perspective from In In. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, thank you for being here with me today. So I'm from Singapore and I founded this startup called Port District. I have a co-founder who is male. So um, how I came into tech was initially when I first um, finished my diploma, I was just looking for a job casually so that I can attend university and not have to worry about my daytime uh, burden from the job. So I chose uh, a position as customer service with the Rocket Internet um, set of companies where they are an investment branch and they have many different companies in Singapore. So when I enter uh, the first company, I realized that there are so many small little mini companies everywhere doing the same thing and they are called startups and they are all very tech oriented and that's when um, I, I got thinking so I guess tech is the thing right now, but I graduated with a diploma in MassCom where I was meant to go into advertising. So it just came into my face that if everyone is doing tech, then you know I must be doing something uh, with tech too. Let me dig about it and find out more. So eventually, um, because it's a startup, I managed to learn very quickly and I have to. And then I realized that um, why tech was very popular was because with this technology, a lot of people would receive help. It's actually very solution-based. Um, so to me, it was very much like magic where uh, I went on to find out how to code. To me, it's like, hey, you wrote something in English and when you deployed it, uh, magic happened. Everything just kind of falls into place. It became interactive. Everyone was able to use it. So this is how I went into tech. And how I founded my company was that in Singapore, uh, we do have a lot of chatbots and they are mainly used by corporates. So people have this image of chatbot as um, very boring. Uh, it only answers FAQs and things like that. Eventually, we created Singapore's most popular chatbot called Bus Uncle. It tells you bus timing, it's humorous and funny, and it has a very spunky personality. 
So it ended up getting viral. And from there, we realized there's a gap in the market where people are looking for interesting chatbots. They want to speak to a chatbot that has life. They want to um, engage with it like a human. And from there, we realized that, okay, we want to now extend this service to other people to help them build chatbots with personality that they are fun and people want to use rather than the chatbot keeps saying, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't understand you. Why don't you just drop me an email instead? So we founded our own companies with the idea of helping SMEs because we realized that building chatbots um, in a very customized manner, it's very expensive. While SMEs, um, the trait of an SME is that they are very, very hardworking, very hands-on. So we decided let's build a platform where we give them the tools and we teach them how to build a very interactive chatbot at a very affordable price. So that's how my company started. Um, so I used to think running a startup is very glamorous because uh, while I was in school, I saw Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook, you know, being like the most amazing things. And um, what I felt like was a good experience for me is that I grow with the company. So eventually I started to learn how to code. I started to pick up more responsibility. Um, A to Z, customer service to accounts, I'll do everything. So it's really more, I think I gain more than my company because now I can do all these things on my own. And most importantly is the satisfaction of having one of your user tell you, I'm so glad you created this uh, and it saved a lot of money for me. So, yep, that's basically my experience in uh, running the company so far. Thank you. Thank you, In In. So that uh, Maz was nodding when you were speaking. So I think that uh, she was recognizing herself in some of the statements you were sharing with us. Uh, now, let's continue the round with uh, our uh, other entrepreneur on the panel, uh, Miss King Keo from Laos. So please share a little bit about uh, your company Laos with us. And also as the other speakers, what made you interested in technology and whether it was difficult to pursue uh, this, type of, this type of career according to your experience. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. And hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me for this uh, webinar. So this is my first time uh, uh, for, uh, for such a speaker. Um, my name is King Keo Duong Sawan. I am the CEO of Datacom, which is an IT company in Laos. Um, let me introduce uh, a little bit about my company, what is Datacom is doing. Uh, we are one of the leader in the system integration and ICT services. This year is our uh, 23rd uh, years of doing business in our market. Uh, our services uh, are power in full solution. We provide uh, enterprise uh, and consumer IT products and become an appointed uh, distributors and partners uh, for many well-known uh, branded, such as Dell, uh, Huawei, Cisco, Oracle, and etc. Uh, we are one of the first uh, local company who built our own uh, small data center to provide a core location and uh, the uh, um, um, managed services to our customers. Our solution services is uh, also including all the design and implementing for enterprise uh, infrastructure as well as for the cyber security. And lately, uh, we have a team to focus uh, on the FinTech solution, which uh, 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 we are uh, developing uh, some application for banks and microfinance. Um, and about myself, how I uh, landed uh, to, to this uh, tech uh, career. Uh, I have been working for Datacom for more than uh, 20 years already. And I started uh, first as a programmer. Um, I graduated uh, computer science in uh, Germany in uh, 1996. Uh, uh, the reason why I selected to study this tech field was uh, because uh, I always uh, loved to learn uh, mathematics and logical thinking at school. And at first, uh, I thought uh, I would be an architect after my father. But uh, when I finished high school and got scholarship from Lao government uh, with the funding of DRD, I was uh, supposed to study uh, medical technique, which uh, I, I didn't... Uh, uh, 
like that much. But uh, I was quite lucky because uh, my university allowed us to change uh, to study in any fields uh, available at uni. And at that time, uh, informatics was uh, the new hot uh, faculty and, and topic to study. Hence, uh, I decided to change uh, uh, from uh, medical technique to study uh, informatics instead. So I thought at that time uh, it was a uh, cooler and I could uh, apply to many uh, careers in the future. So, and is it. And then after my uh, graduation uh, and came back to hometown, the first thing I would like to, be, to do was uh, lecturing uh, at University for Computer Science. But um, at that time, uh, there was no, um, no quota for lecturing in this field. So uh, I was, uh, then I was applying to a well-known uh, international uh, organization in IT department. Um, I was uh, confident with my degree that I would be accepted. But in fact, I, I was uh, rejected. The reason why, because I'm a woman. Um, at that time, uh, they believed that uh, IT was not the job for women because uh, women might not uh, uh, work uh, hard or uh, can carry some heavy computers or fix it. So uh, I was a little bit disappointed. Then uh, the next uh, fighting job took me to Datacom where I got the opportunity to do uh, to work as a programmer in the team. So uh, I work uh, uh, from, from then to now as a CEO of the company. So with my personal experience, uh, we can say that in those days, uh, if uh, night years, women in tech are quite rare in our country and you would find more medical, uh, medi uh, medicine, uh, uh, medical science or business administration. So compared to nowadays, we can find much more uh, women in various uh, uh, key IT positions in companies, in uh, public sectors, or even the owner of the IT companies. So this is my experience uh, for the uh, women in tech and in Laos. Thank you very much for sharing uh, with us uh, this experience from Laos. And thank you very much also because it's the first time we have an entrepreneur from Laos in the series, so we are particularly excited. Uh, now let's continue with Liza. Um, Liza is from the Australia Science uh, Agency, as we were saying before, and we know that Australia is well regarded as a leader in promoting women empowerment. Uh, at CSIRO, you have developed many initiatives to uh, increase uh, women in STEM. So can you play, please describe these initiatives to us uh, initiatives both in Australia and ASEAN. Uh, please, Liza, the floor is yours. Thanks, Julia. So, um, so as you were saying, yes, CSIRO is Australia's National Science Agency. Um, our purpose as an organisation is to solve the greatest challenges um, in the world with science and technology. And to do that, you need to embrace the full human potential and get the best minds, regardless of gender, on that job. Um, and it, scientific research, it's been proven, is more accurate um, and more uh, impactful when gender is considered. Um, examples of gains from gender inclusion in science include better designed seat belts and airbags by having you know, crash dummies built like women or developing safer drugs for women by including females in toxicology tests. Um, and it's really important to understand that women bring really unique perspectives to research and scientific conversations. Um, and I think this is really poignant when um, artificial intelligence and machine learning is about to launch us into a revolution, the scale um, perhaps we have not seen since the industrial revolution. Um, and so to avoid bias, we need more women writing those algorithms. You know, I don't want to live in a world and I don't want my daughters to live in a world where machines tell us that men are more suited to technology jobs because that's what the historical data models that the algorithms have been trained on tell us. So, um, uh, Julia's asked me to talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that CSIRO have um, committed to and invested in, um, both in Australia and, and um, what our work that we do here in, in ASEAN. Um, probably one of the major gender initiatives is um, what's known as Science in Gender Equity, um, sorry, Science in Australia Gender Equity or SAGE. Um, so we were a founding member of SAGE, um, which started in 2015. Um, and it's all about improving participation, retention and success of women in Australian higher education and research. Um, it was 
initiated to test the Athena Swan Charter, um, which was sort of founded in the United Kingdom. Um, and you know, those familiar with the Athena Swan Charter know it, it asks its members to adopt 10 principles which focus on promoting and supporting gender equality for women in science, particularly in science and technology. Um, and the, the charter aims to address this leaky pipeline issue of women in science and technology progressing to senior roles um, by removing some of those obstacles to their advancement, ensuring equal pay, and mainstreaming support for those women through all, you know, across um, all levels in an organisation um, with very specific and deliberate action. Um, so we definitely, um, as much good as being done in Australia, we, we do, um, women do continue to be underrepresented in STEM fields and we, particularly at senior levels, and we certainly have a leaky pipeline problem, which we're looking to address. So some, some statistics, um, at the moment, women represent more than 50% of all Australian STEM undergraduates and just under half of all STEM postgraduates. So we're getting good, we're getting good acceptance. Um, we need to you know, keep, the, keep that focus on getting, get, getting young girls to go into to STEM um, uh, uh, disciplines and, and STEM, STEM qualifications. But we have less than 20% of our senior scientists in Australian universities and research institutes um, are women. So we need to fix that problem. Um, and we need to fix up the problem that only 27% of women make up the Australian STEM workforce. Um, so some of the specific actions we've invested in in, in CSIRO, um, in, in, so to get our accreditation um, for Athena Swan, our bronze accreditation. Um, first and foremost, we made a very deliberate decision at senior levels of the organisation that this was something we're going to invest in. Um, we have two people who work on this full time um, on implementing the actions um, that the senior leadership have committed to and then measuring and tracking our progress against those actions. So we have something called balance, um, which makes all the roles within our, our organisation flexible. So working from home, job sharing where possible. Um, and this, was, this happened before um, COVID-19, but it's become very relevant during COVID-19 disruptions. We had an analysis of gender pay um, in like-for-like -like roles across um, the organisation. Oh, time's up, that goes really fast. Um, but yeah, hopefully I'll get to talk more about the initiatives um, in, in the Q&A. Liza, feel free to wrap up. Huh? I mean, it's just a gentle reminder. <laughs> yeah, <one> yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, a lot, I'll, I'll, again, I'll talk more, but a lot about role modelling, a lot about um, looking at unconscious biases that exist and really having not just women in the organisation, but senior men in the organisation. Um, there's a program called Male Champions of Change. So they, they're signing up to say there are, there are systemic issues with respect to unconscious bias that we need to address. Um, and one of, I think one of our best things we've done um, is appoint a, a chief scientist recently, um, our first ever dedicated chief scientist who is a female, Dr. Kathy Foley, and she has made it her life's work, not only to be an amazing applied physicist, um, but also really promote the importance of gender inclusion and diversity, um, role modeling, being a public advocate, and really bringing up early career researchers with her, which, yeah, happy to talk more about in the Q&A. Thank you, Liza. Thank you for reminding us this is not a women-only conversation, and indeed, we are very happy to have TJ with us uh, later on also in the webinar, because it's equally affecting all of us in terms of opportunities. Liza mentioned about uh, the importance of diversity and gender diversity, and there's indeed a growing body of research showing that uh, diversity, including gender diversity, is absolutely key for uh, innovation, for instance. So again, it's really a topic that is concerning all of us for better performance and better achievement. Mm. Uh, we can now start uh, our second round, and uh, I would start again with uh, uh, Yin Yin and Maz. And I would like to discuss now a little bit uh, what can be done. Uh, Liza has already mentioned that, but let's continue with that. What can be done to, uh, let's say, uh, encourage and improve women participation in STEM uh, and also startups and the digital economies? Um, let's start this round with Yin Yin. Uh, what can you share with us? the floor is yours. Hello. So um, in general, I feel that um, some of the issues that are preventing women from getting into the STEM field are uh, gender stereotype. So especially in Asia, where I am, I'm in Singapore, there's still some hints of gender stereotype that exist, such as uh, women will eventually go on to have children and look after the home. Therefore, you know, for a long-term career, 
it's not so viable for them to do something that is very knowledge invested because then they'll eventually leave anyway. That is not true. And also there are some other gender stereotypes such as uh, women are better in arts while men are better in like logic. Again, that's not true. And it doesn't help that the industry in STEM in general is already very male dominated. It's a very male saturated space. So naturally there are some um, bias that are set already by these um, males that have already been in this space much earlier. So what I feel that can be done is to have more women role models that young girls can look up to. So the reason why I have courage to step into this space is that when I was working for Rocket Internet, I have a very, very strong and encouraging female boss where she treated me very differently than my previous boss who was male, who actually told me, hey, you're really emotional, um, you know, and I don't think that you can go very far being this way. So that wasn't very helpful. And when I tried to pry, what do you mean by emotional? It was just very vague. So while my boss, she is super, super good. She was always very encouraging, very precise, very clear. And she doesn't only give me advice, but she actually uh, portrayed that to me where our big boss was actually male and she stood her ground and explained very clearly, very calmly her stance and why it will work and why it will not work. And that was when I got um, inspired. I was like, hey, you know, I want to be like her when I'm older. She's strong, she's firm, she's gentle. And more than everything, she's not afraid of um, our bosses who are actually very fierce. So she really inspired me. And I think like some attributes that um, not just women can have, male as well are great, but women especially are a bit more thick skin, I think, because I, I did get a lot of comments like, you look like the intern of your company. Maybe you need to cut your hair. Maybe you need to put on uh, some darker color clothes instead. So I think for us, at least for now, we'll have to be a bit more thick skin, be very firm with what we believe in, and of course, have a lot of determination. Yeah, so that's from me. Thank you, In In. I think many of us totally agree with you. Now, immediately over to Maz for uh, her thoughts. Hi, um, okay, I, I, I really agree about having a good role model for the young girls who wants to venture into STEM. Um, like me, I'm in, in startup, you know, the image that girls see is that startup founders are geeky, dorky, and nerdy. Like startup founders walk in with their backpack, with a t-shirt, with a, you know, their, their logo across them, and then with glasses. And then if you, if, if people always, uh, people always project, like, you know, if you're in a startup, you're stuck in a room in front of the computers all day, all night. This is not an image that young girls want to, I mean, how, how do I say, appeal to young girls. You know what I mean? Like, imagine if we have a, a campaign where the lead developer or a startup founders actually look like one of the Kardashians. You know what I mean? That will make the whole um, ecosystem more interesting, more appealing to young girls. Because, I mean, oh, like it or not, this is their era. It's all about uh, instant gratification. It's all about the visual they see, you know? So if I want to be involved in something, I mean, I want to be, because kids nowadays, they like to share things on social media. So imagine like, okay, hi, hello guys. Yeah, I'm doing an a, a Insta story that I'm in front of my computer and just programming, you know, do some programming away. But what people are missing is actually the fact that whatever that you do has a greater impact on the economy, has a greater impact on people because startup, um, is known to be able to change uh, a nation's economy. You know, innovation drives economy. So, I mean, I was just uh, looking, um, reading the statistics from Startup uh, No. It says that worldwide, there's only 14.1% founders there are female. You know, and about reading further, I, um, there, there's this statistic that say that the top three startup ecosystem for female founders is actually the first in Chicago, second is in New York, and the third, surprisingly, is Kuala Lumpur. So apparently in the whole of uh, in Malaysia ecosystem, 22 to 24% of female startup founders 
uh, I mean, sorry, for startup founders are female, which is very encouraging. So I feel sometimes we female are uh, having this, um, how to say, confidence issue. We have this image issue. We, we do not want to be uh, competing or in fact, like uh, for, for my daughter, who's like super smart, she got, she's one of the top 30 students in Malaysia last year for the national exam. And she, she's been given a scholarship to study in the UK. And I know she's very good in programming because she's consistently uh, one of the top students in programming at her high school. And somehow when I say, look, you know, I don't mind you doing economics, but you you might want to try, you know, do Python programming on the side, but I will not because you have very analytical brain. But the only thing I got from her is like, mommy, I'm, I'm already very nerdy. Do you want me to be dorky and geeky too you, you know what i mean so that's the image even for the brightest student that's what they see so for me having if we can put that kind of role model the one that i said just now to say that being in tech being in startup creating something that can bring changes bring profound effect to the communities to the world is something that you want to be in it's exciting tech is sexy sex help fuel digital economy that sort of thing um, so, and to have that confidence to compete with men. Um, I also read, you know, recently in Business Financing UK on the website, it says that forever a dollar being invested in a startup that has at least one female founder, the return is 78, uh, 78 cents, which is 78% of one, um, uh, how to say, one dollar being invested but for the fee for the male uh, co-founders you know startup that has male co-founders the return is only 35 percent so uh, to me, sorry 35 cent so it means that we startup founders with the female ones have more how to say are more successful in a way in running startup you know so we women shouldn't be having that kind of um, lack of confidence or inferiority with men so we should really embrace our strength we are multitaskers you know we are great at communicating our ideas we are great at analyzing data so just embrace it thank you that's for me thank you very much Maza, for uh, these very detailed uh, uh, remarks uh, you are mentioning about the low rate of funders of startup funders uh, female ones uh, let's uh, keep in mind that uh, you know also the venture capital industry is typically male dominated and there's a you know a rich body of research showing that uh, there are lots of gender biases in that industry so women startups they face more difficulties in getting in, get, in yes. getting access to credit for instance yeah um, and now we can continue the discussion with uh, uh, kim keo in laos um, you can perhaps tell us a little bit uh, about the situation in your country regarding girls and women in tech and also what kind of initiatives are being implemented in the country to encourage uh, more girls uh, and women in these types of career. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Kinkyo, I think you are muted, so please unmute yourself. Sorry. I forgot to uh, admit. Okay, first uh, I would like to. Uh, uh, I, I agree with the two speakers uh, uh, that uh, uh, to have uh, the uh, role model for encourage more women in tech. Uh, but uh, one of the uh, key factor that I I can find is uh, the education as well, uh, because uh, education which is not only providing the formal education, but intensive training as well, so that we make a. Uh, 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 women and girls uh, uh, find uh, more opportunities uh, for them in the field uh, and they are, are more welcome to, to work in this field. Um, like uh, uh, in Laos, uh, there are some uh, great initiatives uh, which has been uh, implemented uh, to provide training for young people. So uh, for example, the, the STEAM Lab uh, uh, project which is provide a skill for young people in the field of uh, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. So it, it can provide the training to people uh, for them to be ready with high skill in the tech area. So this program uh, is also encourage women to join. Um, another, another thing, uh, another um, uh, initiative uh, is, uh, for example, Tok Lao. Tok Lao, uh, which is an, an incubator, and seed uh, uh, funding investment uh, started by uh, female entrepreneurs. And it has been uh, incubating uh, more than 30 companies uh, to become a new successful startups. 
and uh, the, these startups are mostly led by, uh, by women as well. And uh, also, I'm also glad uh, uh, that our company is also takes part of uh, uh, in this uh, uh, um, meaningful initiative to create more human resource with skill to serve uh, the IT sector in the uh, country. So, um, and uh, be able to support young people, especially for the uh, women in tech. And uh, with the uh, growing of the uh, internet users in Laos, we have now uh, about uh, the 3 million uh, Facebook users uh, uh, from our population, about 7 million. So we can say that half of, of the population uh, has the Facebook. And therefore, I believe uh, the IT technology sector will grow and provide a job of um, opportunities. So, uh, but however, the challenge in Laos is uh, 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 we, we still have the challenges uh, compared with other non-tech uh, carriers. Uh, you can find uh, um, that uh, uh, young girls at school aren't being uh, encouraged uh, enough to consider STEAM carriers. And, uh, and it is still uh, unsure what it would be like. So many girls uh, think, uh, may think of jobs uh, that can make a, a difference uh, difference or positive change, uh, uh, but they still cannot connect this uh, with working with technology. So uh, in Laos, uh, for example, in a uh, 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 countryside, people uh, uh, reply mainly on agriculture and natural resources. So number of girls uh, uh, might not uh, be able to continue their, their high education due to, uh, due to the uh, um, poverty or social uh, norms that focus on a uh, household and uh, or taking care of the family. So, so uh, we but uh, we cannot change uh, uh, this uh, overnight. But uh, I think if uh, we have more and more uh, women um, in tech, uh, this uh, would uh, partially uh, encourage women to take uh, this career path. Young women only need uh, the role model as a uh, as a. Uh, 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 the two speakers uh, said, then uh, I think if we have a, a more role model in uh, women to, to, to lead and uh, to have the career intake, then, then uh, this, can, um, this model can drive and force and uh, encourage more women to be interested in technology and access to the digital area. Yeah, this is from my point. Thank you very much, Kim Keo, uh, for sharing your experience uh, and uh, what's the situation in your country. And now let's conclude the second round uh, with Liza again. Um, again, uh, you have experience both in Australia and us at ASEAN level. Uh, to continue this conversation on what more can be done uh, to make sure that girls, but also adult women, acquire more STEM-related skills. Uh, so, what can be done, what can be implemented, and also uh, main obstacles and challenges that according to your experience, typically girls and women face. Sure. Uh, over to you, Liza. Okay, so um, I completely agree with the role modeling. Um, you know, that, that phrase, you can't see, so you can't be what you can't see. Um, I'll come back and talk about a couple of specific initiatives there um, to, to actually um, do that role modeling at scale. Um, but maybe a couple of different ideas. One, one which we do a lot here in, in the region is around networking. And um, uh, I think Maz, she, did, she mentioned the WhatsApp groups and those sort of, those formal and informal networks about supporting each other as women in, in STEM. Um, we've, we've set up some you know, um, sort of ASEAN level um, women in, in science in particular networking groups. Um, we, we've learned that women in particular network quite differently to men. Um, and, and so, you know, we've sort of developed those networks around, um, women, you know, women are typically more focused on building those longer term personal connections. They're not as, they they tend to form smaller and deeper networks that are based on trust. Um, they're not as naturally good at asking what they want from in a networking relationship. So, you know, it takes, you know, I guess, putting that investment to build those networks and sort of as a science agency, helping to facilitate the development of those networks. Um, 
we also in the network we, we invite guest speakers um one of our, our guest speakers a, a common topic is the, the notion of resilience um i remember one of my pe favorite pieces of feedback or advice given was um a, a very very senior woman in uh stem said when things don't when things go wrong don't be a victim as soon as you become a victim you're giving your power away um so reframe it as what can you learn and what you would do differently um, I also think as, as a woman, as a mother, as an aunt, uh, we need to also check our own um, unconscious biases. Um, my eyes were really opened when I went to a, a school night at my daughter's school. Um, head of elementary curriculum said how they'd never heard a mother um, say to their children that they were bad at reading, but they had heard n numerous times mothers say, oh, don't worry, I was really bad at maths when I was going through school. And they, you know, so many people, and unfortunately, mothers tend to express that they were bad at maths, which is was just more, more likely a bias that's been passed on, probably from you know the, the previous generation and the generations for that, due to the sort of those sort of society's biases about the relatively strengths, the relative strengths of boys and girls, which we know not to be true. Um, just really quickly, a couple of things we've done around the role modelling. Um, uh, Australia's launched something called their Superstars of STEM program. So every year, sixty women. Um, are sort of selected to become highly visible public role models and they receive training in public speaking, media, storytelling. Um, they're coached in how to address imposter syndrome um, and, we, yeah, and, and help to build confidence in a range of professional settings. And they're also sponsored and supported to go out and engage with, with girls in you know, um, primary schools, secondary schools to sort of give them, uh, provide very visible and accessible and relatable role models. Um, the other thing that Australia has done recently is appointed its first Women in STEM ambassador, which is actually a government fun funded role. Um, professor Lisa Harvey Smith, who's an astrophysicist and also a professor of practice in science communication, holds that role. Um, and they just launched a new campaign called the Future You Initiative. So it in aims to inspire girls between the ages of eight and 12 to participate in STEM subjects by showing them what they, that, that skill set and that those qualifications could lead to. So they've got, you know, animated videos and, and skill-based games that feature um, do characters that are, you know, renewable energy engineers and game designers and food technologists. Um, so it actually, it takes it away from being STEM to being actually a career which is really funky and exciting and as, you know, filled with lots of potential. Um, yeah, so uh, that, they're probably the things I'd highlight. Thank you very much for this uh, very dense uh, information and concise uh, uh, remark. So we have a few minutes left, left for question and answer. So I would immediately hand it over to TJ for this final part of the discussion. Thanks very much, Julia. Um, very interesting sharing. I have learned a lot as a man over the last uh, half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, I've got two questions. Uh, perhaps let me start with the second one and I will want to expand the scope of this um, perhaps in the next one to two minutes for each of you you know um, how how would you or what would you do you know what would you do to to be a role model in STEM in in where you are yeah um, Maybe let me start with uh, Ms. Kinkale, uh, no, and then um, I will just go down. Yeah. So if Kinkale, you could share, you know, um, as a women entrepreneur, as someone who is in this field, what would you do to be a role model? Yeah. To be a role model, uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, every, everyone, uh, if uh, uh, they think about the role model, they think about the success uh, a person. Uh, for example, for, for, for my career, I'm uh, as a woman in tech, I'm uh, uh, a computer, in computer science, I'm doing the business. Uh, to be a role model for, for the next generation, I, I would uh, make my business or uh, career more successful uh, so that uh, the, the successor or, or the uh, anyone that would like to follow in, in my career would see, oh, oh uh, they have the example to be successful in the career and uh, to provide then then uh, to be success then uh, we uh, we need to share all the experience and the knowledge to the to the other people as well 
Okay, thank you so much. How about Yin Yin, my fellow countrymen, countrywoman, sorry. <laughs> so Hello. How, what would you do within our Singapore context? So in a Singapore context, I think uh, my, what I would do is I would start with girls, women who are close to me. That includes uh, my friends who are younger than I am, who are still in university, that uh, I'll let them know that if they need any help from me, the, the line is always open. If they need a chat, if they want to ask about anything related to their career, how is it that I managed to found my own company? Um, and what's the process and everything. So I think for me, how I would be a role model is to always leave a line open for any girls, woman who wants to talk to me uh, to, to not be afraid to do so. And also I will actively help uh, younger girls um, on their homework. So for example, some of my housemates, they are in school and they have uh, some issues with writing essays and such. And I will always start by offering them help rather than uh, waiting for them to, to ask me. So everywhere I go, if there's young girls, women, uh, I would always offer to help them. Even my mother, um, because my mother is older, so of course, very traditional and all. I would offer to have conversations with her about what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and what I think my future would be. So one at a time. I will start to speak to them and hope that they will come back with more questions. Yeah, that's how I do it. Okay, thank you so much. Mas. <laughs> Hi, uh, I do actually, uh, the way that I advocate this, I do a lot of sharing on my own uh, social media. Uh, wherever I go, like the other day, I met um, Aerodyne, which is one of the biggest aero uh, what do you call that? a drone company in the world and it's based in Malaysia so I would sort of like um, highlight that oh you know what I do meet up with all these people but in a boardroom full of 10 people I'm the only woman so we definitely need more women you know girl power here and in fact like I talk about IT all the time like me with my daughters in a car whatever so at 15 years old, she already know how to do google sheets how to do collaborative working you know she revamped the whole whole um, uh, prefect um, married demerit system at her school using Google Sheets, everything is shared online. So that kind of knowledge, I think, shouldn't just be in your head. Uh, wherever possible, you should share it. Um, I also do um, volunteer as speakers at events uh, such as this one. And in fact, on Saturday, I volunteered to be one of the speakers for the career day at my uh, former alumni, you know. And uh, I feel it's, it's that um, these things, it starts with you and I go around wearing like this. I go to start an event with my dangling earrings and whatnot, just to give sort of like a nicer picture or a sexier or glamorous picture of what IT is, you know, rather than everybody turn up with their t-shirt, logo t-shirt, with their backpack. I turn up like this is my long dress with heels, with my uh, Chanel and whatnot, just to kind of like say, hey, this is, you don't have to be boring. You are smart, you know, you can contribute to the nation, you can contribute to the community and you can still be you, no? So that's, mm. I think that, that is very important to give the girls, to empower them to be who they want to be and yet still be someone that um, can contribute to the nation, yeah. Awesome, thank you so much. Liza, any thoughts from you, please? There we go. Um, so I think in a lot of our uh, initiatives in ASEAN, um, so which I'm responsible for, we, we insist on a gender lens before we commit to any sort of major investment. So we do a lot with um, the Australian aid program. Um, the gender lens is baked into a lot of that, which is great to see. Um, we also though at any, we, um, we actively seek out Initiatives where we can, where, which highlights the importance of, of, of gender diversity, particularly in science. We, we seek those opportunities out to sponsor and support those initiatives. Um, we also refuse to take part in panels where there's not good diversity. So we won't put our, even if our sort of chief executive is offered a, a very nice speaking role, if the, if the panel or the, the conference doesn't have gender diversity in its lineup, we, we refuse that. And we've actually had examples where our CEO has walked off the stage because there wasn't that diversity. Um, 
and myself, I get invited, you know, of, and, and enjoy um, participating in, in sessions like today. Um, but you know, we're all time. Um, let's say um, poor. Uh, if I can't come rather than say no, I, I've got a practice of saying I can't make it, but I know an amazing female colleague who can make it. Um, so making sure I'm positioning, I guess, my tribe of, of women and putting them forward as, as much as myself. Hmm. Thank you so much, Liza. Um, I, the, I have another question, but this one I would want to ask both Kinkeo as well as Mars, um, because in, even in the past few sessions, there has always been this issue with urban-rural challenges. Yep. Um, where, you know, if we talk about role models, uh, within an urban landscape, it's much easier. What are your thoughts in terms of the role model um, reaching out, you know, because in Laos, in uh, Malaysia, uh, you have got an urban, rural type of a landscape. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Perhaps we you know a quick one minute each uh, in terms of how can we reach out to perhaps the more rural parts of your country uh, in terms of raising the whole profile of you know, women in STEM. Uh, let's start with Mars first. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you, TJ. Right. Um, um, it's interesting that you mentioned that because now we are working with UNICEF Malaysia to to reach out the urban, I mean, sorry, the rural area, but specifically for marginalized community. So these are the people who, because, because these kids are undocumented, they can't go to school. So the discussion yesterday, in fact, we were having this uh, discussion yesterday with UNICEF to actually provide a platform for the teachers themselves to kind of like learn and upset skills themselves in digital skills because um if they want to go back to the to the to the villages and teach the kids yes so they can't be teaching skills where they are out in the open because then they will get caught by the authority so if they can be trained in skills like um, um how to say a graphic design you know, if they can be trained with skills in um how to do a better slides or presentation or sewing or whatever, no, I mean, they can do it at their village themselves. So for me, in order for us to reach out to the um, rural area is to get connected with the teachers, um, where the teachers can actually then be the role model for the kids themselves. Because uh, you have also have to remember connectivity is also a problem for mm. these areas. So normally it's the teachers that have the, um, or are given, uh, uh, how do you say, gadgets or tablets whatever not by the government or by a certain um, corporate to help them to teach the kids. So we are build, helping them build a platform, a digital learning platform where we can crowdsource all these learnings, all these videos about or, or, um, digital skills and whatever not, and the teachers can learn it at their own pace and then later go and teach the kids. So we want teachers to be that role model for the kids to say, hey, you know, I have a shot at life. I don't have to be stuck here like that. Yeah. Thanks very much. So reaching out to the teachers in the rural areas to be the role models. Kinkeo, a quick one minute, please. Oh, uh, if you'd like to unmute your microphone. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. It is quite similar in Laos because in the rural area, uh, um, girls or uh, uh, women uh, uh, still have. Uh, um, uh, are the uh, duty to take care of the family or the uh, the household that I, I said before, and uh, we we should give more education to them to encourage uh, them to know about the the uh, 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 skill uh, career in uh, either in STEAM or in uh, uh, technology something like that. And we are, uh, for example, in, in Laos now we have we have uh, food panda Laos coming, and is it, uh, this business is very successful in our during the. Uh, COVID and after uh, the COVID pandemic. And uh, the, the company is leading by the woman. And everyone, everyone knows that uh, Food Panda is using food of the technology to, to drive uh, their daily uh, uh, operations. And then uh, to reach out uh, these uh, uh, to the, uh, the rural area, I think the most important thing to, to, to get to uh, them to uh, have more education on, on, on this field. Yeah. This is my point. Thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, so thank you, speakers. Thank you to the participants for your question. Um, I just want to share a few quick thoughts as a male entrepreneur in, in this whole chat session, because 
I think what the speakers have shared uh, would really be something that would be echoed for all in that one, be proactive, yeah. lead by example, and I think to continue to share, to be a volunteer, to share, to be that role model. Um, and to partially answer a question that was raised, I would go one step further and to say, let's not wait for government policies. You know, uh, you and I as entrepreneurs, as business people, uh, as, as stakeholders, let's just take that first step. Let's just do it. When we start to do it, then, you know, the other things will fall into place. Yeah. Because very often, you know, we, we, we have this tendency of, oh, yeah, you know, let's, let's wait and see what the government is going to come up with. Um, let's put it this way. Sometimes it's probably better for you to just take that first step and move with it. And then down the road, get the support from your local governments. Yeah. So with that, you know, um, I will pass the floor back to Julia. Thank you, TJ. I think it was a perfect conclusion and uh, the time is basically over. So I just would like to thank uh, once again uh, uh, the fantastic uh, the speakers for the fantastic discussion we had. Thank you to Kinkeo, Mark, In In, and Liza once again. And thank you to all the participants for staying connected until the very end with us. And we look forward to continue the conversation with all of you uh, in two weeks' time with the next episode of the series. And we will talk about fintech. Uh, some of our entrepreneurs today mentioned uh, this issue and we will discuss more in two weeks' time. So thank you once again to everybody and uh, we can now close the meeting. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.